Hey guys, welcome to our next lesson. This one's about conditional probability. <clears throat> so go ahead and get these notes printed out and then we'll dive right in. So conditional probability means you have two um, different events that could happen. And in this case, we're gonna call them A and B. Um, the conditional probability is the event, the probability that B will happen given that A has already happened, okay? So we're gonna put in this blank here, already happened. So the notation we're gonna to use to represent this, this is gonna be really important when you're reading the problems that we see in this notes and also on you know future assignments. The probability, remember in the last lesson, we used P and some parentheses to represent probability. What's happening here is that you're trying to guess the probability, not guess, but calculate the probability that event B will occur given the condition that A has already happened. So probability of B given A. So I'm gonna write that down. Probability of B given A. And there's a formula that we can use to calculate this. Um, and we're going to fill that in here. So I will switch colors to my orange, and that will be the probability of B given A, that's, that, that's a vertical bar that we're drawing there, okay, is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. So on the numerator, we're taking the joint probability, the, co the, the, the compound probability that these two things are happening, and then divide them by just as if the first thing is happening. Okay, so <clears throat> let's do our first example. This says that um, Mitchell drew a, de a card from a, de a standard deck of playing cards. And um, what's the probability that he drew a queen given that the card was red? Okay, so the, the and part is easy to figure out because you need to find the probability that the card is both a queen and that it's a red card, and that'll be your numerator. The denominator is the part that you're given, okay? So if you're given that the card was red, okay, remember the given thing goes in the denominator. The, the probability that it's red is going to be half the cards because there's um, 52 cards in uh, a standard deck. 26 of them are black cards and 26 are red. So this probability is 26 out of 52. And then the other probability that we need to know here is just um, the probability about the queen. There's only four queens in a deck of cards. So the probability of it being a queen is four out of 52. So the way that you calculate this is you literally take the, new, the top of the, um, the, the equation for compound probability is, is going to be the probability that they're both happening. So four out of 52 times 26 out of 52. And then you're gonna divide that by the probability that the given thing already occurred, which is um, 26 out of 52. And when you do the calculation for that, you can plug that into a graphing calculator or a scientific or desmos.com or something like that and just find out the answer. You get four out of 52 times 26 out of 52. And then you divide that by 26 out of 52 and you get one in 13. So the answer here is one in 13. And the way you translate this answer is you're saying, I have a one in 13 chance that when I pull a card from a deck of cards, the probability that I, it will be a queen, given that it's a red card, will be one in 13. Okay, so we will swap over here to the next problem. The next problem is number two, it says, um, a number from 1 to 100 is randomly selected. What's the probability that it is a perfect square? Okay, they spelled square wrong, so that's awesome. Um, what's the probability that it's a perfect square given that it is an odd number? So the thing you're given is event A, okay? That's the thing that goes in the denominator. So the probability that it's an odd number, well, if you're counting from 1 to 100, half of those numbers will be odd and half will be even. So this right here is 50 out of 100. Um, 
And then the other probability that we need to look for here is going to be um, the probability that it's a perfect square. So if we think about numbers that are perfect squares, it means that when you take the square root of it, you get a nice clean number. Um, <coughs> so for example, one squared is one, two squared is four, so on and so on. So how many of, of those perfect squares exist between one and 100? One's a perfect square, um, four is a perfect square, nine's a perfect square, and these squares are one, two, and three, and so on. And the highest one that we can go up to um, would be 10 squared, which is 100, because 100 is the, the limit of our range here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, that's 10 digits that are perfect squares in this range. Well, they, they, they are perfect square roots is what I should say. Um, so there's 10 um, perfect squares. So the probability of perfect square is 10 out of 100. So what you're looking for here is the probability that they both occur, that's on the top, and then you divide it by the probability of the given event, which is gonna be 50 out of 100. Um, let me switch pen colors here so we can write that out. <clears throat> that's gonna be 50 out of 100 times 10 out of 100, and then you divide all of that by 50 out of 100. And the answer that you end up with um, is, let's see, 50 out of 100, 10 out of 100, divided by 50 out of 100, and you get one in 10. So one out of 10, one over 10 is the result here, okay? Um, so that means you have a one in 10 chance that when you select a random number between one and 100, that it will be a perfect square that's odd. Okay, so that's that's what they're that's what that question is saying. Okay, um, let's roll the screen down and we will start talking about the third example. And this one is actually um, a lot of there's a lot happening here, but it's actually a pretty easy problem. Um, one where you don't even really need to invoke this this formula for this conditional probability because the problem kind of it, it actually gave you all the information you need already. Um, so with that being said, let's read it. So um, <clears throat> there are 62 people that take a yoga class and 48 that take a spin class. 15 people that take yoga also take spinning. So those two groups of people that we just said, 62 and 48, they share 15 people between them, okay? Um, if a person from these groups is selected at random, find the probability that he or she takes a yoga class if you know that they take a spin class. So the easiest way to break this down is you already know the probability of the and, meaning yoga and spin, and so that is 15. They literally told you that there's 15 people that are doing that already. Oops, let me, I think I zoomed a little bit, okay. So it's gonna be 15 divided by something, and what's the something? Well. The something is going to be the thing that you were given, which was the spin class. And you know there's 48 people that are taking the spin class, so that would be 48. And your result here, if you divide these by five, um, you can kind of uh, reduce this fraction. That's gonna give you three over 16, and I think that's the lowest, yeah, that's the lowest that one goes. Um, and that is my like palm of my hand here that's like resizing the screen, sorry. Okay, we're gonna zoom back in. All right, so the answer here is three and 16. There's a three and 16 chance that um, if you pick a random person that they take a yoga class um, and they take a spin class, okay. All right, so the next part of this, okay, the next part of our notes here are about two-way tables and it's like an easier way to sort of organize all the information you have about a sample set. And we can take some probability measurements just by looking at um, what's in our table. So a two-way table compares two categories of data. So in, in the example we were given here, um, we have the sports preference. So this is the first category. And then we also have, um, it. okay, so we took we took a poll of 50 randomly selected students and the other category they're using to um, like break this data down is by the gender of the students. So this would be our second category, would be 
the gender at the top. So um, let's figure out the probability that that a person. Okay, so what's what's the probability that a person who was surveyed would prefer football, given that they are female or a girl? So <clears throat> the way we can figure this out is we need to add up the number of people who prefer football. That's not right. We need to add up the number of people who are female, and that would be um, our, our denominator. So let's make a fraction. The denominator here is gonna be the number of girls surveyed, and the total number of girls surveyed was 22. So I'm just, I'm just adding up um, how many there were in the survey. So the denominator is 22. The numerator is gonna be the compound probability. So what's the, what's the number of people who are female who prefer football? And that number is six. So um, if we try and reduce this fraction, um, we can divide it by two and we're gonna get three out of 11 and that's as low as we can go. Um, just making sure this is centered, looks like it, okay. So bam. And then our second question says, what's the probability of choosing a boy given that they prefer hockey? So on the denominator, you need to have the total number of people who preferred hockey overall. So that's 10 plus 16, which is 26. That's our denominator. In the numerator, you need to have the, 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 the compound probability that they are a boy who prefers hockey. Okay, and that number comes out to 10, okay, according to our table. And that's the probability right there. We just need to reduce this fraction. So that would be five out of 13. And that is the lowest that it goes, okay? Um, so let's roll to our next page. Page two of our conditional probability notes here. We have another two-way table that we're gonna start with. Um, and I'm gonna do two of these examples and you guys are gonna do the other two, okay? Um, the first question, well, let's read the problem. The table shows the results of a poll of 150 randomly selected middle school students who were asked if they take French or Spanish. So um, looking at the categories that we have here, we have our first category, which is the grade, okay? And then we have our second category, which is the subject, French or Spanish. And this is if they're enrolled in that class or not. Um, the first question, this is actually, it's, I, I'm not gonna say it's a trick question, but it sort of is because it's not asking you for a conditional probability. There's no, it's not a condition here. They literally wanna know what's the probability that you choose a seventh grader who likes French? That's it. So the number of seventh graders who are, not likes French, I'm sorry, who takes French. The number of seventh graders who take French is 25. That's right from the table. And how many students are there all together? Well, there's 150 of them. Oops, I zoomed that way in, sorry. And I did it again, whoa. Okay, hold on. Okay, fixed. So it's 25 out of 150. And this number reduces to one in six because there's 125 in 100 and, uh, there's six 25s in 150. So um, one in six would be the answer for this section. And that was just looking at the information we were given. Okay, letter C says, the probability that a person that you pick takes French given that they are a sixth grader. So. On the denominator, you need to have the total number of sixth graders. So if I go to my table, that would be 19 plus 23. Um, so that's gonna be what? 9, 10, 11, 12, 42. So we have 42 sixth graders altogether. Now what's the probability that they are a sixth grader who is in French? Or what's the number of kids who are sixth graders in French? And it's 19. So um, I'm not sure if this, I don't think it reduces. Um, no, it doesn't reduce, 19 is, is prime. So, okay, this is, this is the final answer. I'm gonna get rid of this equal sign. Okay, that's our final answer there. And then the other two, you're gonna figure out. So you wanna take all, in number, in letter B, you wanna take all of the kids who are in Spanish as your denominator. And in the numerator, you wanna just put the joint event, which is how many eighth graders are in Spanish, okay? And then a similar issue with letter D. Okay, so we're going to roll this down. And the next section of the notes here are about something called joint relative frequency 
and marginal relative frequency. And what this is talking about is basically you have a two-way table, okay? And we can represent this information numerically, like a count, like the number of students who, you know, fall into both criteria, or we can represent it as a percentage of the total number of students or people who are in, you know, whatever the sample set is. So um, we're gonna take, in this example, we're taking this two-way table right here, I just circled it, okay? We're taking that two-way table and turning it into a frequency two-way table, okay? So that's the next step. Um, let's, let's start filling some of this information in here. So well, let's read the problem. It says, the table below shows the number of first class and coach class passengers on a plane who checked one bag, two bags, or no bags. Um, find the joint and relative find the joint relative and marginal relative frequencies and then find each probability. So what we're talking about here is a joint relative frequency. There's there's two things we have to decode here. Joint frequency means the numbers that are in these cells, okay? And it's called joint frequency because it's the number of where this these two categories are joined. And then 52 is the number where these two categories are joined. And then 12 is where these two categories are joined and so on and so on. That is that is what this table is right here. And then if we turn it into a relative um, frequency table, we wanna represent what is, let me erase what I just drew here. We wanna represent what percentage is 16 as it relates to the total um, in that column, in the row, and in the, in the table, okay? Um, so the first thing is first. In a, relative, in a frequency table, a relative frequency table, the bottom right corner is always going to be 100% because all of these cells should add up to 100 and all of these cells should add up to 100, okay? Um, now let's start filling some stuff in. So in the first class, two bags, we counted 16 people. Um, and in order for me to say what the um, frequency of this is going to be, I, I need to know some totals um, of this information before I can proceed. So I need to actually add up how many people I have in this sample set in the first place. How, how many people does this add up to? So let's, let's do some addition real quick. 16, 12, 2, 52, 60, whoops, and 18 is 160. So there's 160 total in the sample space. So um, the number of people who fell into first class with two bags is 16, and the relative, uh, the joint relative frequency of that would be 16 out of 160 represented as a decimal. So let's let's calculate that. Um, I'm gonna write it down just in this one. It's gonna be 16 out of 160. And I know that without even looking at a calculator is 0 0.1, okay? Um, in the rest of the cells here, I'm actually not gonna write the fractional version or the how do we calculate it. I'm just gonna write the decimal. So what is 12 out of 160? Let's add that up. Oops, 160. It's 0 0.075. And then what is two out of 160? That's gonna be a pretty small decimal. It's 0 0.0125. Um, now, when you total all of these decimals in the first column, you're gonna get a total for the bottom of this, which is 0 0.1 plus 0 0.075 plus 0 0.0125, which is point. 1875. Now these are being represented in this problem by um, decimals and that's fine, but you know decimals can be converted to percents just by multiplying by 100. So if I'm not mistaken, this is 18.75%, which means that my coach figures here should be making up the majority of this data. There should be a lot more data. There should be um, like 80, 81.25% of the data is represented in coach. So let's put that theory to test here. 
Um, there's 52 out of 160 people who in coach who check two bags. So 52 out of 160 is 0 0.325. That's 32% of the data just in that cell alone, okay? 60 out of 160 is 0 0.375. Um, and then we have 18 people out of 160, which is 0 0.1125. And let's add all this together, 0 0.375 plus 0 0.325. That is 0 0.8125. And just as I predicted, these two values at the bottom, they add up to, point, uh, they add up to 1.0, which as a percent is 100. Um, so we also need to fill in the rows here. So when you're in the rows, you go across. So you would add 0.1 and 0.325, and that's going to give you 0 0.425. Um, in our second row here, we're going to add up 0.075 plus 0.375, which is 0 0.45. And then 0 0.0125 plus 0 0.1125, which is... 0 0.125. So if I add these values up in this column, I should get one, which would be 100%. So 0.425 plus 0 0.45 plus 0 0.125 adds up to one, so we are good to go. Okay, um, the last set of problems that are on this page here, they say um, we're finding some probabilities here of stuff that um, is occurring in this sample space. So. The first question says the probability that of a coach class passenger that did not check any bags. This is actually um, something that we have calculated already because there's no condition here. There's no vertical bar that is drawn here like you see in letter C or letter D. This question is literally just asking um, about the coach passengers who have zero bags checked. Well, that was 18 out of 160, but do I need to punch that in my calculator? No, because I already know from my uh, relative frequency table that that value is gonna be 0.1125. So the answer here will be 0 0.1125. I don't even have any calculations for that. I just, um, I just needed to find the value in the table. Um, Letter B is similar to letter A, so you go ahead and figure that one out. Letter C and D are very similar problems because they are conditional. So we're gonna do, go ahead and do letter D and you can take care of letter C. Um, we wanna know what's the probability of finding a passenger who checked two bags given that they're in first class. So the first question is how many people are in first class because that's gonna be our denominator, okay? And the number of people in first class is 14 plus 16, which is 30. Then you wanna find for the numerator, what's the probability of these both things happening or how, how many people um, check two bags and are in first class, the joint probability there. That would be 16 um, because in our table, it told us that there are 16 passengers that have two bags in first class, so 16. And this is a fraction that can be reduced to eight over 15, and that would be your final answer. And I didn't box this either, sorry, there we go. Okay, so that is actually it for this lesson here. Um, there's a grade for doing the notes, the example problems um, that we did together. There's a separate grade for completing the practice problems. Those are the ones that are boxed out in orange. And then there's also going to be um, I believe a delta math for this section. I haven't created it yet, so there there may or may not be. I'll you'll you'll know for sure because of Google Classroom. Um, but there there may be a, a delta math assignment that goes with this. If you guys need any help with anything from this lecture, please feel free to jump into my Google Meet office hours. Those are Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10:30 to 1:30 p.m. Um, or you can send me a message and we can try and link up. Um, and I can find you some additional resources or help you with whatever your point of confusion is. All right, thank you guys. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.